Hi, and welcome to A World of Faith, a podcast which brings faith leaders and politicians from all around the world and from every sect together for a dialogue on the practice, the politics, and the philosophy of religion. I'm Michelle Nimi, and I'm an undergraduate student at Harvard University, and I'm fortunate enough to be co-hosting with Syed Ali Abbas Razavi, the Director General of the Scottish Athelbeit. In this episode, we have the pleasure of sitting down with Professor Mary McLeese, the former President of Ireland and the Chancellor of Trinity College, Dublin. We discuss how we might critique the religious institutions of which we are members and Professor McLeese's philosophy in reconciling her religious beliefs with her presidential obligations. Professor McLeese, it's our pleasure to welcome you to World of Faith. There is so much that's been remarkable about your career and academic trajectory thus far, not the least in its diversity, as you've served as a legal academic, a university administrator, you've obtained a licentiate and doctorate in canon law, and you have perhaps most notably served as head of state for two seven-year terms in Ireland. A two-part question then, how did your faith inform and interplay with your professional journey? And did you ever feel that the duties entrusted to you in defense of the law and then of state foisted tensions upon your personal faith convictions? Thank you very much, Michelle, for having me. Um, thanks, Syed, for suggesting me. Thank you to both of you. Look, um, <laughs> that's a good, uh, a good starting point, Michelle. Uh, let me just explain to you. I'm born in Northern Ireland. Um, that little tiny part of the island of Ireland that was partitioned a hundred years ago to create a Protestant state for a Protestant people and south of the border what was to be a Catholic state. And uh, unfortunately I was trapped in the northern bit and as a Catholic uh, where we were automatically all Catholics were second class citizens with very much reduced civil rights. So there's the scenario. And um, so I'm born into that. I was baptized into the Catholic Church as a baby. Um, immediately, of course, by baptism, becoming a member for life of that church with a whole bunch of obligations uh, imposed on a non-sentient child of probably about a week old. So, um, and I didn't really notice that part, that, you know, that reality for quite a while, uh, because so conscious of growing up with a Catholic identity in a place where to be a Catholic was to be second class. Um, and for the people who were making you feel second class, and who were actually intent upon making you second class were also Christians, uh, at least nominally. Uh, they were members of uh, the Anglican tradition, the Presbyterian tradition, the Methodist tradition. And, um, but more importantly, they saw themselves as British and they saw us Catholics as Irish. And so to be Catholic and Irish was to be placed in opposition to the idea of being British and Protestant. So I grew up in a place with a history, incidentally, not 100 years old, but probably more like 900 years old, but certainly certainly at least 400 years since, well, post-Reformation, um, very significant um, sectarian tensions between Catholics and Protestants. And um, growing up with that, I also lived in what's called a flashpoint area, um, a very poor, um, very, very poor parish with 70% unemployment, uh, which ended up being the part of Northern Ireland when the Troubles, which was which is a euphemism for a civil war, broke out in 1969, a sectarian war broke out in 1969. The place I lived in was the place with the, and is the place with the highest um, per capita um, sectarian murders. And my family were victims of um, an attempt really to get Catholics out of there. I think so that formed me because suddenly as a teenager, you know, you're confronted with very big questions. How do you deal with this? These are neighbors um, who are trying to get, you know, to, to make you move. These are neighbors who are killing your friends. These are neighbors um, with whom there is not a good neighborly relationship. Um, and, um, and so you have, to, uh, you have to answer to yourself, what, what are my values and principles here? How do I, how, how do I respond to that? I lived in a Protestant neighborhood as it happened all my life. And so I could see the temptation for young Protestants um, who also grew up and were formed deeply, deeply, deeply formed, as indeed I was. They were very formed in their Britishness, in their sense that Catholics were to be feared. Um, they were the other. 
And, and, and I grew up as a Catholic, always realizing that the British Protestant was also the other. And even though we lived cheek by jowl, the gaps between us were enormous. The mutual fears, the mutual contempts, uh, they, were, they were the kind of combustible material on which sectarian violence had erupted over almost every second generation. So I had to make up my mind, where do I stand here? And I think I was very fortunate both in my parenting and it, I also possibly in the fact that I was a woman because young men were much more likely to be targeted you know, when they were angry about stuff that was happening to their community. They were vulnerable to targeting by paramilitaries. Um, they weren't so interested in girls really, uh, thankfully. So I was never targeted by them. And instead I had mentors, like I had a wonderful priest mentor um, who listened um, carefully while I talked through these things. I had parents who absolutely abhorred violence because I had, I'm the oldest of nine children. I had five brothers coming behind me. The last thing my parents wanted was five brothers who were gonna be drawn into paramilitarism. Um, so they were determined that, you know, that I would set the standard and my next sister, we would set the standard for the rest for the younger ones, which we did. Um, we were all pacifists, thankfully. So that, so my faith in a loving God who had to have somewhere the answers to the, these, the, the, this dreadful explosion of hatred and conflict between Christians, that always exercised me from, you know, from I was a teenager. And it was, it was the reason I chose law, Michelle, because I lived in a place where the police force was Protestant and hugely hostile to Catholics, where the legal system was hostile to them, the political system, the judicial system, everything was mounted against them. The laws were against them. And my view was uh, based really on the witness of a man from two centuries back, a great character called Daniel O'Connell, um, a member of parliament at Westminster in his day, um, the man who introduced human rights to, um, to the Westminster Parliament, championed black slaves in America, championed Russian Jews, championed Presbyterian liberation and Catholic emancipation. His view, having experienced the French Revolution, was stay away from violence. If you have a problem, if you have a serious problem where elites are oppressing the masses whose rights are being whose rights are being cold and 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 um and restricted by these powerful elites the answer lies in constitutional or democratic dialogue it lies in talking and persuading no matter how long it takes it does not lie in taking to violence so i was persuaded by that and then that's why I became a lawyer so the two things are you know my religion um informs my choices um, my, uh, my belief in a loving God and my belief in the possibility of the, of the change that human people are capable of. Um, I believe that we could, through persuasion, change things. I knew that from O'Connell. When, when, when Dan O'Connell died um, just before, just in the middle of the Irish famine in the middle of the 19th century, he thought he had died as a failure. But, you know, well over, a, well, well over 150 years later, we see... Um, the, the thread of his thinking just grew, it grew in hearts and minds. And some people became the champions of it in the late 20th century. And they were the people that I looked up to, people like John Hume, um, that great, uh, remarkable human being. So, um, yeah, so one informs the other. Like, to be honest, when you grow up in a very religious environment, and I grew up in a religious household, not dead pious now, it wasn't terribly pious, but nonetheless, we were Catholics. You know, we went to Mass, we did all the Catholic things, uh, and we had a very strong sense of our Catholic identity. That shapes you. And frankly, um, the, the parts of it that, that corral you and keep you from fully understanding the otherness of the other, they are quite hard to shake off, you know, because Catholicism in my, when I was growing up was imbued with an appalling sense of its own destiny, its own rightness. I mean, I was, I grew up before the Second Vatican Council. I was a child born in the aftermath of the Second World War. So before the Second Vatican Council and a modicum of humility settled on the magisterium of the Catholic Church, just a modicum, um, as well it might, because when you read the history, for example, of the church's teaching on the Jews, it's absolutely 
toxic anti-Semitism that flooded that flooded countries like Italy, helped to flood countries like Germany. Also, you would find it right across Europe. You would have found it wherever Catholics were gathered. That anti-Semitism that didn't allow them and should never have allowed them to wipe their hands of any responsibility, you know, for particularly for fascism in Italy and its, uh, uh, well, never mind fascism, long before fascism, uh, uh, responsibility for the way in which Jews were treated in the Papal States, for example, until the Papal States disintegrated, um, but the fascism in Italy. And eventually, even though, of course, the Catholic Church um, was also oppressed by Hitler and, and contested Hitler, it contested him not because of his laws on racism, essentially, but because of his oppression of the Catholic Church. So, I, will, I you know, over time, thank God, Michelle, with the education that I got, I was equipped, thank, and, and was thanks to Catholic schools too, I began to be equipped with the critical powers that allowed me to, crit to critique, not just the people who were oppressing my own com community, um, Catholic Protestant, but also to critique my own church, which was also oppressing its people, you know, women, gays, uh, LGBTI, uh, families, um, uh, child planning for family planning, taking control, trying to exercise control where they had no business exercising control. So I was always a contrary sort of being. And you speak of having been raised before Vatican II, Professor McLeese, and indeed of Catholic anti-Semitic invective, of its political interventionism in, in Italy and indeed in Latin America. Over the course of and on either side of your presidential tenure, you have not shirked the claims of incorrigible regressiveness and inequity with which the Catholic Church has been beset. You've been a vociferous advocate of the ordination of women in the Catholic Church. You've decried the Catholic Church's unwillingness to confer primacy to norms and laws which protect children's rights, as you said. And to the chagrin of some Catholic leaders, you were very unapologetic in your most recent vote to repeal an anti-abortion amendment in the Irish Constitution. Earlier this year, you wrote to Pope Francis denouncing the Church's ostensible complicity in the sexual abuse of members of the Lash community. Professor McLeese, one of the prevailing critiques of institutionalised religion is that religious leaders are wont to exploit their privileged and oftentimes monopolistic moral position for the sake of perverse ends. To what extent, however, towards what you are gesturing towards the end, does the obligation fall upon individual religious adherents to challenge the norms of, say, the Catholic Church, even when such adherents may feel that their religious convictions are contingent upon that institution or so deeply bound up in them? Well, I don't know that I can answer for everybody who sort of stands their ground in opposition to the church on various things, or indeed who might walk away from the church. What I can say is that in my own case, I feel um, deeply um, a strong calling and obligation um, with the education that I have um, and the voice that I have. Um, to where it is appropriate and needed to be critical of my church. Many churches, I think, and many faith systems have grown out of a culture of proselytism and of evangelism. I think we still are trapped to some extent by this feeling of um, the need to proselytize, to convert, to evangelize with a view to um, converting the other. Um, and I, I'm quite hostile to that idea um, because I think it often gets in the way of allowing us to critique our own internal church life, its teachings, its structures. Uh, I look at the Catholic Church, for example, let's take Pope Francis as a good example. He does what every Pope before him has done really very well, which is use the pulpit that is uh, St. Peter's at the Vatican to speak out to the world on major moral issues. And he does that well. He speaks out on climate change. He speaks out on migrants and the need to welcome and embrace them. He talks about the option for the poor. And these are, I think, um, excellent um, uses of that, uh, that huge pulpit out to the world. Uh, on the other hand, they're also easy. What else would you expect from a great Christian leader? but that they would care 
for the environment that God created, that they would care for God's creation, uh, migrants, that they would care for the poorest of the poor. And that's uh, always been the case, um, well, almost always been the case um, uh, with popes, uh, that they can talk out to the world from a very lofty moral platform. What they are appalling at and traditionally appalling at, and still appalling at, and this is true, unfortunately, also of Pope Francis, is they are they're appalling at turning their gaze back into the church and saying, now, where do we not match up? Where are we deficient as a church? Where are we hypocritical? Where do we say one thing and do another? If, for example, they say, oh, we must, as they did in the past, we must love the Jews, uh, but on the other hand, we'll support Mussolini and we won't say much when Hitler introduces um, you know, racist laws and we'll support uh, Mussolini when he does the same, uh, when, you know, when he strips Jews of their citizenship um, and closes their schools. So, you know, um, uh, but we must love them. The same, the same, of course, with uh, LGBTI. Oh, we must love gay men and women. Uh, but on the other hand, we reserve the right to say terrible things about them. You know that um, that that there is no such thing essentially as homosexuality. That it's some kind of a fiction, a choice that people make. Um, and that, um, uh, but they are to be loved. But homosexual love, you know, is intrinsically disordered, um, and indeed worse than that, evil. Uh, those words have all been used by popes in, in my lifetime. And so, you know, it's trying to have it both ways. Um, I look at, for example, the one pope after another in the 20th century, starting with John the 23rd, um, saying we have to do something about women. You know, there are 600 million Catholic women, 600 million, because one in six people in the world is a Catholic. So 600 million Catholic women are utterly, absolutely excluded. Their voices are excluded from the decision making and the magisterial teaching and the formation of that teaching in the church. That exclusion is, is just, it is utterly immoral nowadays. It's unacceptable. What have they done about it? Nothing. They've promised every Pope since has said, oh, we must do something about women, but then they do very little. Or worse than that, they appoint a token woman here and a token woman there, which is so 1970s as to be pathetic. Um, we who have, you know, soldiered in this field of glass ceilings, we recognise tokenism now, you know, from a distance between, from, you know, from Dublin to St. Peter's, we can recognise it immediately. So. Um, my problem now is, as a, as a, as a Catholic uh, raised in this church, um, do I do what everybody else does? But well, not everybody else, but so many people do. Do I exercise the human right that I have, uh, recognized by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to walk away, to change religion, abandon religion, to simply, or do I do um, what the Universal Declaration also says I, I, I can do, and that is, do I exercise my freedom of thought and conscience, and do I do that within the church? Now, Michelle, I choose to stay, for the time being anyway, I choose to stay um, because there's 1.2 billion people at risk here, and um, 1.2 billion people um, who are adherents of the only faith system in the entire world that it has permanent representative status of the United Nations, which tells you something about its power and influence. It's the, only, it's, it's the biggest NGO in the world. It does great work in the developing world. One has to hand it to the Catholic Church. It does phenomenal work. It's, you know, the bees... Um, not the queen bees in the Vatican, but the, you know, the bees who are buzzing around the hive, the people of God, the people of God, the men and women, the priests, the nuns, the religious, the teachers, the mummies, the daddies, you know, the 1.2 billion people all over the world. They create great communities. They create good schools. They create great you know, housing for the homeless. They create wonderful places for um for, for orphans and children who are abandoned. They are the first on the scene whenever there is, you know, when a war breaks out or famine breaks out. They do, it is the biggest NGO in the entire world, runs 200,000 schools, educates 70 million children, a key influencer. That is why I stay. Because, Michelle, as a key influencer, it has conduits into people's hearts and minds that are hugely powerful. And down those conduits come misogyny, 
generations, centuries old, incredibly powerful. Down those conduits come homophobia. Along with all the talk about a loving God and peace on earth and goodwill to all men, down along with, you know, love the earth, you know, la data si, all of that, down those same conduits come the things that poison minds and that the church, at the, and I, when I talk about the church here, I'm talking about the teaching church here. The curial church, the teaching church, simply cannot absolve itself from responsibility for that. And I and many others believe as Catholics that we can't let them, that we have to use our voices to draw attention to this hermetically sealed bunker in which this tiny, tiny number of celibate men who are ordained dare, dare to formulate teaching, which they then dare to tell us we must obey. Why must we obey that? Well, because when we were baptized as babies, we undertook the obligation to obey. And my answer to that is actually, sorry, but you have to read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights now, and you really have to read the Convention on the Rights of the Child now, because a whole other world has happened while you were, you know, while you were praying um, and teaching, and that world has now transcended your teaching. It has transcended the obligation. None of us, not one single baptized Catholic on the planet today has an obligation to obey the magisterium of the church. Why? Because they have a divine right as human beings to make up their own minds, to express their own conscience, their own thought. So that whole idea of obligation, you know, that follows from the baptism of babies who weren't even awake when the obligations were imposed upon them is now, it's a structural nonsensical mess at the, at the base level of the church that has to be confronted. Sooner or later, the Catholic church is going to have to say, our catechesis has to shift from obligation to invitation. I stay around in the hope that I might make a contribution to that, and maybe in a hundred years' time, whatever's left of the church will actually admit that it, it has to happen. So, Professor McLeese spoke so eloquently about the deficiencies of the culture of positivism and a compulsion towards evangelism, in that it forecloses really the possibility or the desire to critique your own institution. Well, if I can begin first and foremost by thanking Professor McAleese for such a wonderful overview and insights. It's always a pleasure for me to listen to her and to gain from her wisdom. In regards to your question, Michelle, I'm going to just unpack it because it is quite loaded. To start off really by saying that centralization within the Shia community has decreased over time especially within the last couple of decades. However, if you are to go back, let's say to the fifth century of Islam, what you do find is that there was an unofficial centralization and there always has been. So within the fifth century of Islam, what you find is a personality by the name of Sayyid Murtaba, Sharif Murtaba, who was really, you could say, both the political and the spiritual leader of the Shia community. And of course, at that time, the Shia community was a very small community with a very small landmass. But then over time, what you do find is that this unofficial hierarchy remains. So though it's not enshrined within a constitution, but of course there is an unwritten hierarchy. And as the Shia community then expanded, what you do find is that the centralization of Shiism remained within the religious seminaries. So when it was just Najaf, for example, there was one leader. When we developed Qum, let's say, or then after that, the Shia community then develops, and there's a seminary within Lebanon, or for example, within India. What you do find is that there's various, you could say, dean of these seminaries who appear. But amongst them, as was custom, they would have just one leader. So there would be one superior, you could say, one um, source of emulation who they call the most knowledgeable. So he, was, he would be the one who would be unofficially the leader of all of this kind of council, unofficial council of scholars. 
Now, for example, within the last, say, thousand years, there has been pockets um, or eras where you do find that all of a sudden the Shia source of emulation or the Shia leadership is not just spiritual, but it also becomes political as well. To give you an example, in the time of the Safavis, though the Safavis were kings, but at the same time, the influence of the scholars, the ulama, was quite profound. And though the Safavi dynasty was a Shia dynasty, by this marriage between state and religion, religion really kept out, or the scholars really kept out of political decisions outwardly. Inwardly, of course, they would be advising the king. So basically what that meant was that if, let's say there was a discrepancy, or let's say if the people weren't happy with a particular ruling, this would come back onto the king but it wouldn't have any effect on the religious institution. And in this way, you've seen in different types of periods, the scholars shifting their dynamic in terms of the power that they wield. 20th century, you see similar things take place. Though you find that there's two institutions now, two theological seminaries, one of Nejef, one of Qom. But I guess at the beginning of the 20th century, Power was in Najaf, so the dean of the seminary in Najaf held, the, what one would say, the marjaya in the sense that there, he, he was a source of emulation. This then later on shifted to Qum in the time of Ayatollah Burujurdi. It shifted back again, Ayatollah Hakim. Then in Najaf it stayed until Ayatollah Khoi. Within Qum in the 70s, you could say, there were four maraja at the time or four sources of emulation, who had an agreement amongst themselves. And so in this way, power, although there's almost a council of scholars, so if I was to give it a comparison to Catholicism, it's like a council of cardinals, but it's not called that, it's unofficial. And there's a hierarchy. So there's a figure that sits on the top, who's recognized as being the most wise, as being the most comprehensive, who encompasses all of the fields of Islamic thought. And he may not be the most knowledgeable in all of them, but he's definitely the most comprehensive and the most knowledgeable in terms of his comprehensiveness. Now, in the last couple of decades, that dynamic seems to have changed. And with basically the individualization of each one of the seminaries, what you now do find is that its leadership has become more regionalized. And I guess that in itself becomes a challenge sometimes. Though what you do find is that there is cooperation amongst the various schools. Um, but at the same time, it isn't, I would say, as strong as it once was. So for example, I guess Ayatollah 1992, let's say, was the last marja source of emulation that encompassed maybe 90% of the Shia world. Today, if you look at, for example, Ayatollah Sistani, maybe 75% of the Shia world follow him. So that's still a quite a high percentage. But the fact is, it's not 90 to 100%. You know, there was a time when it, where there was 99%, let's say, in the time of Sharif Murtaba and Sharif al-Ravi, for example. And then after that, you also find in the times, let's say, even within Ayatollah Khoui's period, Ayatollah Hakim, Ayatollah uh, um, Burujurdi, you, you found that the vast majority of Shia, therefore, would do taqalid or follow, as they say, as a source of emulation on person. So, in response to a part of your question, I would say that no, there is a level of centralization and it's become less centralized in the last couple of decades. Now, developing on that, look, the idea of exclusivity, I would say that the vast majority of dogma found within faith is exclusive. The nature of theology is such that the majority of groups within religions do have a kind of exclusive understanding. But what that doesn't mean at all is that maybe theologically one may be exclusive, but remember theology itself is a science. But I guess the principles of Shiism and what Shiism is based upon is actually inclusivity. And this you can go back 1400 years ago to when Imam Ali was the caliph 
and he sends one of his, you could say, ministers to Egypt. When he sends him to Egypt, he says quite an important thing to him, or he writes a letter um, which instructs him how to govern. But there's a line in that that's quite important. And in that he says that, look, when you go to Egypt, you're going to see people of different backgrounds, of different religions. But do remember one thing. Either a person is your brother in faith or your equal or your brother in humanity. So there is an emphasis there that, yes, theologically, in terms of dogma, there may be a, an exclusivity. But in terms of practical application, we must remember that there needs to be an inclusivity, at least on the theoretical level. So within Shiism is that the idea that we're inclusive as human beings is a very important thing. Whether somebody decides to follow that or not, that's a different matter. Now let's contextualize it further. Let's take it down, let's say, to the period of time we're living. What pushes individuals to become, I would say, exclusive as opposed to inclusive is a lack of understanding of the other. And if I was to go and look at my own example, perhaps 10 years ago or so, when I first started, or probably even longer than that, actually, I would say at least 15 years. So we're going back to 2005, 2004. When I first started to do interfaith work or as one could say, multi-faith work. And I guess there's a stark difference there. I would say I'm more of a multi-faither in the sense that we're not looking at theology. What we are looking at is for faiths to come together and to somehow bridge the divide, uh, to work together to help humanity at large. And I remember that there was a subtle opposition at the very beginning. And the reason being is that this is something that wasn't done before. And so all of a sudden you find a cleric coming forward, let's say, on an official capacity in 2011, 2012. And we're doing interfaith work. And I remember um, an elder came to my father and said, look, why is he doing interfaith work when he's not an expert in Christian polemics? You know, surely there should be somebody who's an expert in Christian polemics. And I remember my father replied and he said, that's exactly why he's doing it. Because he's not there to sit down and have a debate on polemics. He's there to bridge gaps. And for me, that's very important. And of course, the, the elderly gentleman didn't get it. But how can you speak to another religion without trying to almost convince them and convert them? But we're not here as evangelical in that way. We're not here to convert people. What we are here to do is to show the goodness in humanity. And I guess at the beginning where there were many people who were skeptical, this changes. And I've noticed over a period of years, and especially now, everybody wants to get involved. Everybody wants to you know, go to Shabbat, or everybody wants to go to church, or everybody wants to celebrate Diwali, especially in the new generation which is coming up. And so I found that with the challenges, and you know, of course there are challenges, people do call you names, people don't like it when you're thinking out the box. When one goes above and beyond, let's say what people are used to, their comfort zones, you, know, you do get a barrage, you do get insulted, and it is difficult. But the most important thing is this, that if you know that you're right, and if you can justify to God as people of faith, then you move forward, and you try and bridge those gaps. And that's exactly what we're doing. And I do feel that it's making a profound impact in, let's say, the country that I live in, let's, in Scotland, in the United Kingdom, in Europe at large. You know, there are certain things that need to be seen and need to be heard. You know, I still remember that... I think my greatest inspiration is Imam Musa Sadr, uh, the Lebanese cleric. And what I remember, and again, I remember a story about him that one day Imam Musa Sadr goes to um, an ice cream parlor with some of his friends. And as he goes, he orders ice cream. So one of his Companion said to him, I said, look, you, know, you don't even like ice cream. Why are you ordering this ice cream? He said, look, I'll tell you later. Just order everybody ice cream. Let's go outside and sit down. And so the ice cream was ordered. And of course, he didn't like, or he, doesn't, he didn't like ice cream. So he didn't eat it, but he'd ordered it for everyone and everybody ate it. And after that, when he got up and went, his companion again came to him and asked him, he said, look, why did you do that? And he said, the reason why I did that was because this parlor is owned by a Christian. And some Muslims had gone and spread not to eat from his parlor. And so I thought that as Imam Musa Sadr, if I come here, it's going to inspire the Muslims to come and just to 
show them that it's okay to eat her. And these are the kind of acts of kindness that I think are more important sometimes than just theologizing. You know, I do find that when it comes to the religious establishment without sometimes realizing it, we close ourselves in our seminaries um, and sometimes we're not accessible to the people. And of course, in the last couple of decades, especially since migration, um, and especially since the expansion of the Shia diaspora, the scholars of the Shia community have now gone to the people and do talk to the people and do um, find out what the problems of the people are. And that's their main responsibility. But sometimes when you're tucked away in a religious seminary, and of course, if you take, let's say, for example, Najaf al Qom, you know, Qom, for example, 50,000 students, let's say, you're tucked away. And it's very easy for you not to realize what's actually happening and what the pulse of the people is, you know, what makes people tick sometimes. And this is why it's important that there needs to be a continuation of people traveling, keeping in touch, lecturing, going to communities. But anyhow, so what I do find is that sometimes we can be, without realizing it within our own bubbles in such a way, that we're not exposed to the outside world. And I think the prophetic mission has always been if you look at moses he was a man of the people if you look at abraham he was a man of the people if you look at jesus he was a man of the people if you look at the prophet muhammad he was a man of the people for all of his life he spent time with people he helped people and i think going forward if you know as we said if there was a way of checking check and balance i would say that or at least my suggestion would be that to truly understand to make the right decision requires one to understand the people and in future I would like to see more and more some of our uh, younger clerics who are coming up to be part of the people, to be involved with the people, to be talking to people, to understand people. Part of that understanding is to understand the society and the culture that you live in. Now, let's say, for example, and again, unpacking your question a bit more now, in terms of checks and balances, you know, what do you do when there's a moral question? What do you do in terms of consciousness? And what I would say here is that the biggest critic to the Shia scholars are actually the Shia scholars themselves. You know, they do have a way of criticizing one another when one of them perhaps puts a foot out. And at the same time, let's say if nobody does put a foot out to criticize or to kind of, one would say, check and balance. But I think what is important is that the individual or the responsibility is, the in, or is on the individual to make that judgment. And I think some of our stronger scholars have been those individuals who have stood up and again, privately gone to another to say, look, you know, perhaps you shouldn't be doing it this way, you should be doing it that way. But what I do believe in is I do believe in the integrity of the system. And so therefore, to openly have, let's say, God forbid, a slanging match or something whereby two scholars are disgracing each other or fighting with each other. I, I don't believe that that's in any faith, in any culture that goes against the integrity of the system and the establishment itself. So I think that if there is ever a problem, the best way of resolving a problem is that there needs to be internal mechanisms in place. So look, finally, what I would say is this, that look, no religion is perfect. Human beings are fallible. Human beings, or at least clerics, are fallible. They're meant to work on themselves. Of course, when you go down the, the road of, of religion, there is a level of spirituality, there is a level of God consciousness. But as you've seen throughout history, you do find that people who are representing the cloth are not always the best people. So in a situation like that, I think it's important for there to be strong mechanisms of check and balance in place, such that it doesn't insult one person or the other, is done in a very discreet way. Um, and secondly, I think what's also important is for people to understand one another, which means that clerics need to go out to the people, need to be of the people, need to be speaking to people. And at the same time, again, sometimes you may be doing something which is new, such as interfaith or multi-faith, or you may find people who may criticize. I think when you're doing a good thing, when you're serving humanity and when you're building bridges or bridging gaps between people, I think you need to continue to do that. And also to bear in mind 
that if you're not being criticized, there's something good that you're not doing. So I think when you do good, you, you're going to be criticized. When you make a stand, you're going to be criticized, not to be afraid of criticism. So, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Um, but what I will say is that we're nowhere perfect. But I think that's the beauty of it. I think that we are working to the best of our ability to adapt to the climate and to the situation. So I'll pause it back to you. Professor McLeish, on the side's comment about this next dynamic between church and state, I was listening to an old recording of a U.S. senator questioning Judge Amy Coney Barrett, Trump's political Supreme Court nominee, upon her nomination to the Supreme Court of Appeals. To paraphrase, the senator asked how Americans could trust Judge Barrett's commitment to the law in light of the dogma of her religious belief. Contained in the senator's remark was a distillation of the binary often arrayed between religiosity and between impartiality, democracy, justice. The belief that religion becomes an overriding and distorting individual preference that's inimical to democracy, unlike other preferences a practitioner of the law or of policy may hold. Given this perception, do you think it's prudent for political leaders, such as yourself, to quote unquote wear their religion publicly? And how do you do so without eroding public trust, generating an otherization, or indeed generating skepticism about what your underlying motives may be? I don't want to get involved in a discussion about uh, Supreme Court nominees in the United States because it's not my place to do so. But let me tell you about my own situation when I became president of Ireland. I was president of Ireland for 14 years. It was well known when I was elected that I was a Catholic. Um, so, um, and I was taken to task uh, about a year after I was elected by Cardinal Bernard Law in Boston uh, because he told me that he, um, that he despaired for, um, for the Catholic Church in Ireland because I wasn't, I wasn't a Catholic president for a Catholic people. And I had to remind him that I swore an oath to uphold the constitution, the written constitution of my country when I became president. And that made me a president for everybody not just for Catholics, not just for Christians, but literally for everyone. I had no business being a Catholic president. And I told him that quite emphatically. I believe absolutely, resolutely in the separation of church and state. And so that is true in when any job that I would go into um, that required of me that I be, that I embrace everyone and, and respect everyone and represent them um, and not use my position in order to further the agenda of my own particular church or whatever that agenda might be. So that I, I, I can come at that question you know, with very clean hands in that regard because over the 14 years that I was in office, I tried in every way possible to show respect for all religions and also for people who have no religion whatsoever. Those, and indeed those who were opposed to religion, um, those who thought religion um, was um, a dangerous phenomenon that was causing endless problems in our world, including very close to home. So all of that had to be embraced um, within the pastoral role that really is very much the moral pastoral, but also constitutional role of the Irish presidency. It's not like the American president. Um, it's not like it at all, in fact, in any way. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's not an executive position. It's, uh, it occupies that kind of moral pastoral space away from everyday politics. Thankfully, it suited me very well. Um, but, I, but I have to say also that if we walk away from the religious thing, as many people do, just completely tired of it because in fairness, religion is making people, um, many, many faith systems in their failure to, um, to show kindness outside of their own faith system. And indeed in my own case, their failure to show kindness to those within the faith system who disagree with the magisterium or who disagree with structure and who want change, that lack of kindness, the, the raw response of which is contemptuous is in serious danger of turning an increasingly educated population around the world off religion altogether. 
For the time being, that's a long way off because five out of seven people in the world, five out of seven, identify as religious. And with one of the main religious phenomena, one of the big faith systems in the world. I mean, the two, big faith, the two biggest faith systems, uh, Catholic, not Catholicism, but Christianity in general and Islam, are in many ways first cousins of each other. They are both huge Abrahamic faiths. Yet when I was growing up, I never heard that expression. I heard about Abraham, but I didn't know that he had any link with Islam. I heard about Judaism, but I didn't know it had any link with Islam, with, with, with either Islam or Catholicism or Christianity. I never heard of our common, our common brother and sisterhood in, in, um, in Abraham. That was a mistake, I believe. It's something that I have discovered as a great joy in my life, thanks indeed to friendship with people like Said. Um, thanks to living in community as I did after I left office. I went to Rome um, and lived in a mixed community with imams, um, with rabbis. We lived together in community, learned so much from each other, helped each other. To, I, mean, I learned so much about the Virgin Mary from a young, is a young imam from Kosovo. I didn't, I didn't know Islam had anything to say with the, about the Virgin Mary. We, in the Catholic Church, we never shut up talking about her. We thought we owned the Virgin Mary. And then all of a sudden I discovered from this lovely young imam from Kosovo, this huge respect for her that comes out of the Islamic tradition. Why didn't I know about that? Why didn't I learn that at school? Why was so much time wasted in introducing me to a bunker of information that kept me separate rather than take us out of the bunker and introduce each other to introduce us to each other in a way that conduces to tolerance and kindness and mutual respect and importantly acceptance of who we are what we are and what we believe and i think that's a major failing one of the great things in the last two years actually i believe in interfaith dialogue and interfaith witness at leadership level uh, where we haven't had enough of it, um, was when um, Pope Francis met the Grand Imam in Abu Dhabi and they together signed a fraternal declaration. It's a pity they couldn't have come up with a better word than fraternal because that's also a touchy subject. But honestly, at the same time, I was just grateful that the two of them talked and came up with a document that set out the shared values because there are shared values, there are shared principles. There, um, I have one of my great friends um, who has taught me so much about Islam, is a wonderful woman from the United Arab Emirates, the first um, elected woman to an Arab parliament, the first speaker of an Arab par parliament, um, Dr. Amal al kabasi And when she and I talk about our faith and God and how we respond to everyday problems, we might as well have grown up in the same household. We might as well have grown up in the same household because her relationship with God, her prayerfulness, her, her need for God in her life, her need for prayer in her life, her approach to prayer, you know, it's so, it's so like my own. And I feel that we, are, we have wasted and wasted so many centuries and generations when we could have been such wonderful friends to each other and guides to each other and could have helped enrich each other's understanding of the godliness of humanity. We could have done all of that. And what did we do? We wasted it in conflict and in mutual contempt and failing to build tolerance. So that's, you know, I think the future has to lie with educated, a really educated generation from below insisting when they see the damage inflicted on their communities, the places their kids can't go, when they see their children in coffins as a result of religious conflict, we have to insist as an educated populace that our leaders reflect our desire to be good neighbors to one another and to create good neighborhoods good cities, good countries, and good integrated communities, not communities of ghettos. That way, we've been there, you know. That's so, un so unhealthy. It's so humanly unhealthy. This emphasis, Professor McClay, on mutuality, on what is shared, as you mentioned, the examples such as the overlap between the Abrahamic faiths, definitely provides a promising thoroughfare through to mutual acceptance. I think so. I want to refer back to the comment that Syed Razavi made, however, about being chastised for selling out when he engaged in interfaith, and indeed of the fate which befell Southern in a very similar vein. 
As part of your presidency's emphasis on building bridges, you explicitly celebrated the Ulster Protestant 12th of July celebration and took communion at the Church of England, uh, Church of Ireland, rather, Cathedral. To reconcile with and rejoice in the other as one's own is, of course, as you mentioned, a central component of the interfaith project. There is also, however, potentially a pragmatic need to take your faith community with you in any serious contemplation of interfaith rapprochement. As president, to what extent were your outreach efforts guided and constrained by how your own faith community might respond to them? And how did you go about thinking about that trade-off entailed between full reconciliation between both full cohorts and making that initial gesture yourself with the knowledge it may well be polarizing? First of all, I believe, I believe that Leaders have to lead out into the deep, uh, into the place that people are afraid to go. They have to head for that further shore and show others that we are capable of reaching it. That's what you do. You push out into the deep with everybody on the shore saying, she'll never make it. That was a stupid enterprise. And then you make it and others follow. So you have to be prepared to go into that deep space um, into that deep water and take whatever flack is coming. But honestly, Michelle, I, in taking communion in Christchurch, um, I never said to myself, how will this go down with the Catholic community? Um, why? Because uh, I believed in what I was doing, that it was absolutely right to show respect to the Anglican tradition and to their, and to their Eucharistic tradition. The very idea that I would go with their invitation and I actually, having asked for the invitation, that I would go and not accept their Eucharistic hospitality, that, that to me would have been a complete denial of everything I believe in. And of course, people railed against it. When I say people railed against it, who were they? The, the Cardinal, you know, the, the leader of the Catholic Church railed against it. Quite a number of priests railed against it. A lot more did not. The vast, when the opinion polls were taken, the vast majority of Catholics and indeed the vast majority of Protestants believe this was the right thing to do. Why? Because the people who live the ordinary everyday lives, who live in integrated neighborhoods, whose kids are friends with each other and who want peaceful and respectful futures, they are so far ahead of their, their, their faith leaders, um, many of their faith leaders, so far ahead that if only the faith leaders would create the conduits to listen to them, they would realize they are out of touch. In the Catholic Church, we don't have any of those conduits, which is why our faith leaders, many of them are completely out of touch. Yet I look at our Archbishop of Dublin, for example, fantastic man, dear Martin. He took part in aid this year. Um, you know, that we had our Muslim, our Muslim citizens assembled at um, it's the only country, the only Muslim country in the world that had a national celebration of aid. Isn't that extraordinary? And it's a tiny population, a tiny Muslim population. But they, they came onto the, uh, the biggest pitch that we have. Uh, it's a place called Crow Park. It's the, the Holy of Holies in terms of Irish football, Gaelic football. And our two, our two archbishops of Dublin, the Anglican and the Catholic, took part. As our Catholic archbishop was going in, he was um, assaulted by a group of very right-wing Catholics, a tiny number, who, um, you know, who, who assaulted him and um, hurled abuse at him for daring to do this. Um, and, and he did it anyway. And you can be absolutely sure that 99% um, of the people of Dublin and indeed the people of Ireland were right at his back saying, good on you. That was the right thing to do. So look, there will always be those, there will always be those who are so dark in their thinking, um, so appallingly dark that they can't open up to the beauty of the otherness of others, to the beauty that they are also God-created others. And that it is such a wondrous and magical and beautiful and exciting and exuberant thing if we open up to it. But these are people of great darkness in their hearts. And honestly, you know, part of me, part, part of me gets frustrated about them, but having lost my home to people like that and having lost almost my sanity at times to them, I know too that they are capable of change and we have to pray for them and we have to try and enter dialogue with them. But more importantly, we cannot ever, ever be stopped by them.
We have to outreach to each other. We have to embrace each other, even in the teeth of their assaults. That's what our Archbishop of Dublin did. What a fantastic witness that was. We would be remiss not to mention the Good Friday Agreement, especially given your being raised during the Troubles and its current imperilment at the hands of the UK Internal Market Bill. The US has been very forthright in its intentions to protect the Good Friday Agreement. Do you have any persistent role in the Good Friday Agreement and its continuation? Do you believe yourself to still have a public role in, in ensuring its continuity or at least advocating for its continuity? Or what is your appraisal of what seems to be an incredibly vexed situation at the moment? I have no official role, whatever, Michelle, um, but I'm one of those people who, after the Good Friday Agreement was signed, there was a referendum north of the border and south of the border, asking the people if they supported it, and they supported it overwhelmingly. Everybody who signed that, and I mean everybody, including me, has a vested interest, therefore, in securing um, the Good Friday Agreement, making sure that it, uh, it has um, that heft, that momentum that each one of us gave to it, gave to it the day we signed on the dotted line, put our X in the ballot paper that said we supported it. And it has a number of uh, pillars, parody of esteem for the two communities, um, a recognition that those who want a united Ireland, among whom I include myself, that they will be given the opportunity possibly in the future to, to ballot on that. Meanwhile, it remains part of the United Kingdom, and that too has its own political integrity. So in order to bring together all those constituencies, there was a huge amount of compromise, of trust, and of generosity, and hope in the future that by compromising, we could create a shared future, a future of partnership. Now, the British government is a co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement. So how do you think it sits with people like me North and South, Catholic and Protestant, who signed up to that, to hear a member of the British government, and not just any member of the British government, but the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, say in Westminster that they are prepared, they are prepared to break an international treaty which they negotiated and signed just a year ago, and part of which was designed to protect Northern Ireland, to protect the peace between uh, on the island of Ireland, to hear them say that they are prepared to, to actually pass a law in Parliament that will resile from, from those international undertakings. I mean, I was horrified. I am horrified. I'm hoping against hope that all we're dealing with here is the kind of bluster and braggadocio that you get because the United Kingdom is involved in very serious negotiations about its future relationship with the European Union, which it has removed itself from, of course. Um, so part of me says, let's hope that's all this is, you know, it's just um, blarney and bluster. If it is not that, they are playing with fire. And they're pl playing with fire that they ought to know better than to play with. Um, it speaks of an ignorance about the civil war um, in Northern Ireland that I and others experienced. It speaks of not just ignorance, but a recklessness, a carelessness about that, and a carelessness about the future peace that we've all so much invested in. So I have no formal role anymore, but I tell you, I have a moral duty to speak out and have done, to say to the British government, please do not do this. You are playing with fire. And we know, I know, um, that the embers of sectarianism and conflict over the years in Ireland, um, they all they seem to die away, and then something reoxygenated them and created another another decade, two, three, four of conflict. So we ha we who have been there have a moral obligation to point that out and to hope that it that in pointing it out, we will be listened to.